So, the annual package Perl buff at StepConf. First, we should check the usual things like who is monitoring IRC. Ah, teacher, good. Yeah. Package Perl. Yeah. Uh, Debian Perl. <laughs> and yeah, and then there's this copy document where I try to put a few things as a rough agenda for the buff and where I would like to ask someone to take notes as we go along. Is there someone who feels dedicated? Yeah. Oh. Good. So for those following at home, it might be nice to be able to put faces to names or nicknames. So as each year I would like to ask for a short introduction for those who feel like doing this. In the unlikely case, there's someone following on the stream who doesn't know me yet. I'm Gregor Hermann. Gregor. And yeah, please go yeah. ahead. Okay. I'm in three. Check the microphone. Yeah, I'm in three, mostly working these days on reproducible builds and hardening of our packages, that's all. And removing uh -huh. the crappy ones. Hello, I'm S. Kainz, Simon, and I'm trying to get my feet wet into the package Perl team by, yeah, uh, trying to fix minor bugs maybe sometime more. I'm Dom, I'm actually working on the Perl package itself together with Nico and getting some of my remaining very old packages into the team repositories. <laughs> I'm Martin Behrens, um, been a Perl community member for several years, um, always a Debian user, but not so far a contributor, but I'm very interested to learn that, and I find the learning curve quite steep. Mm -hmm. So I'm here for some help, to receive help. I'm David Bremner, and you can't see me because I'm also running the camera, but I'm sometimes helping with toolchain issues with Git, mainly these days. And I have a few packages that I still take care of in the, in the team. Okay, so I guess that's so far for the introductions. Then I have to scroll down a bit. So one thing we usually, usually look at are the sprints. We've had, uh, well, depending on how you count it, one or two sprints this year. The first one was in May in Lloret de Mar, embedded in the Debian Sun Camp, so close to Barcelona in Catalonia. Uh, we were four people there, I think. Yeah, there's a, there's a report. So the four people were Christoph, Nico, uh, Alex, and me. There's a detailed report and there's, there are not so many people here now who can talk about it. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure do you want to know something more from my, from my, mem from my memories? Sure. Yeah. The yeah. I think the highlights was that Nico uploaded 526 to experimental. Um, then looking at security issues with the various Yammer serializers. Then, well, one interesting point is that for our auto package tests, where we run the smoke tests, we added dash recurs to proof, which caused failures in, <laughs> I don't know, 50 packages or something, <laughs> which are fixed, fixed by now. That was part of that camp. Well, and some routine work, I guess. I don't know if Alex or Nico want to add something from, from IRC. Mm, 
Oh, cool. Um, another request for a link that was fulfilled already. And Nico adds that. Yeah. So thanks to the SunCamp organizers. <laughs> okay. Well, and during that camp, uh, we labeled our work as a sprint as well, since this was proposed by the <laughs> DEPCONF organizers. Uh, so I, I will write the report at some times. Currently, they're only copy notes. I think we had three coordination meetings in the morning on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And we were like, I don't know, three or four people working on, on different aspects of, of Perl stuff. So Alex did a lot of work. Inter did a lot of work besides doing lots of other work as well. I looked at these regressions from, <laughs> from proof and I tried to upload some of the new upstream releases. Yeah. Right. Could, just, could I just ask about the, the proof uh, recursion failures? Was that always the same kind of bug that occurred in each of those packages or were they quite diverse in how they, they failed? Um, well, there, there, there was several groups of, of problems. So running proof dash request blindly over the T directory is not such a good idea because there's stuff in it which is not meant to be yeah. run as, as a test, uh, which is only meant to be run at release time or, or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what we did now are two things that, um, that we're excluding more of the test files. So there are some typical patterns like t slash author slash. Mm -hmm. and, and well, some others needed some fixes. So the problem with auto package test, with smoke tests and auto package tests are that, that the test directory is copied to a temporary directory and then the tests are run against the installed packages. And sometimes mm -hmm. tests need something from the source. Uh -huh. That's a typical failure mode. Good. So, next year, another sprint. What's your opinion? Do we want to have a sprint? When, where, how long? About which topics? Tom has a microphone. <laughs> Say something. This is an accident. <laughs> uh, well, I, I like the idea of sprints in general. I'll definitely try and make one next year if I can. Um, Same sort of time, May, April, May, maybe. But how many people would come? <laughs> Sixty person chains. Mm. It may depend on the location. So I was sort of assuming somewhere in Europe. Um, the idea is that yes, uh, we're going to go have a buff uh, with people who are interested in doing sun camp or similar things in our place in Europe, but it's definitely going to be something next year around the same time. So if you guys want to join. Yeah, I think having the sprint in sprint in spring does make sense, especially when it's close to to the release of well, 5.28 in th in this case. So it was really good to kind of kickstart the development at the, the sprint. Nico is reminding me that I suggested Oxford as a location last year, and that's still a theoretical option if we don't if it doesn't work to have it at Sun Camp. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess the resolution is there is interest in a sprint and in spring and we, we check if we join some other event or not, which has advantages and disadvantages, I think, but 
Yeah. Good. So much for sprints. What's next? Low hanging fruit sessions. So we've been doing these monthly meetings on IRC since I think three years now. Once a month, where the idea is, maybe was, I think it has shifted a bit, uh, that there's lots of routine, tedious work, which is actually simple but needs to be done, and that it's more motivating to, well, do it together and it uh, together in the sense of at the same time and, and be together on IRC and exchange uh, about the work. I think it's shifted a bit since we've also used the meeting sometimes for, for discussions, for like organizing sprint or something. Well, um, I'm not sure how much people like this to add meeting points to the, to the sessions or not. That would be something I'd be interested in. I mean, in, in general, I thought it was useful to be able to have a chance of talking about items like the sprint or the transition mm. each time. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a I mean, I guess it's useful to have something fixed in the calendar that could be used for that, even if it's not always. Yeah, not, not completely related, but still the low-hanging uh, session related to the low-hanging fruit session is that, uh, yeah, Nowadays, for me, it's mostly like I just like randomly pop up, and if there is something like this is obvious, like, oh, I can just do it, I do it. And there were like one occasion when I was like there, and it's like, oh, what should I do? And it was something written down, but it was not completely obvious to me. Someone helped, like, oh, this is what it means. And I was able, I, I tried to kind of get involved, but yeah. For me, like personally, if there is something like, oh, this is like, this is what needs to be done, like, look, here is here on this list, just refresh some package, or just do this, and I have the background knowledge, then it's fine, I can probably just do it. But sometimes it's just, I just like busy during the week, et cetera, et cetera, and it's just, oh, oh, the session, oh, I, I forgot, and I just like, out of the random, I just like popping in. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this also ties in with our usage of the agenda, which is on the wiki, and which is not so much maintained, actually. Sometimes it's usable. It's, it's, it's a good starting point because sometimes it's refreshed, but sometimes not yeah. that much. Yeah. <laughs> Would it work to fall back and unless there's something you want to do or can do in the agenda, you can just fall back to pet that has plenty of low hanging fruits generally, like new upstream releases, stuff like that. I just did this, that like here <laughs> in DevConf, but there were some time ago, like months ago, when it was not that obvious when I looked at the pad, so mm -hmm. times changes, yeah. Uh, Nico says, um, yeah, they often seem more like just general IRC get-togethers, which is fine. Having the calendar in advance helps a lot. And yeah. We could decide that there are, co there are team meetings instead. <laughs> but I guess, I guess people want to use them for both things. So. Mm -hmm. The timing and general cadence seemed to work well this year, at least for me. Yeah, that's that's the next question. So I, I, so this year we had the first two at 18 UTC because we had not changed the calendar yet, and then we were switching between 17 UTC and 19 UTC. Uh, from the participation, there's not really a difference between the those times. So yeah. 
I don't know. If we want to go on, we can just keep the timing because Damian has already extended the calendar until, I don't know, 2038 probably. <laughs> 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 Something like this. Okay, so we just go on with the existing calendar scheduling and we acknowledge that it's not only working but sometimes also a bit discussing if there's a, a need for it. Right? Cannot be heard in the stream. It's fine. Okay, so yeah, I need to, to run soon, so I, that's a topic I'd like us to address now. Uh, last year, maybe, or the year before, I probably proposed to that we subscribe to email notifications from reproducible builds tests. And after, in retrospect, it seems to me that the amount of false positive notifications is so huge that nobody reads this mail, or, and so there are mostly noise and useless. And generally, I, so yeah, I'm here by proposing we disable this. Anyone sees some value in these email notifications and would like to keep them? Okay, burn it. Yeah. I will ask Holger to try to find out how he subscribed us in the first place because and, and to unsubscribe us. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. Uh, oops. Somehow there's something messed up here. Did I do this? So it should, it should read team status here, but I, oh. oh, okay. Col yeah, collaborative editing. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the annual look at how our team does with some numbers. I checked again the numbers of committers in the last 35 days, like before. So this time there were 54 persons with it, at least one commit on the Debian repository, on uh, the Debian directory in one of our repositories, which is quite similar to the years before. I mean, you could say we are in constant decline from 58 to 56 to 54, oh, but basically it's the same number. And also if you look at people with at least 100 commits, it's now 13 and it was 11 and 14 in the years before, so it's the same ballpark figures. So I think, yeah, I think the Pearl team is, is stable. We are at least not shrinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds a bit negative. Right. Okay, another thing about membership is last year we discussed and then did for the first time this pinging of inactive uh, members. <clears throat> so everyone who hadn't made a commit in the last two years got a, a mail, hey, you seem to be inactive in, in the team, do you want to continue to stay or can we remove you on alias from the project? Which went very fine in my experience, so the, the, the replies were, well, positive or neutral and we cleaned up quite a lot of, of inactive accounts. So this year, uh, Alex agreed to, to do this run again. We just decided this, the both of us, during Deb Camp. I hope that's, that's okay. Alex already sent out the mails last week, and it seems he <laughs> already got <coughs> quite some replies. The deadline is, I think, uh, in mid-September. And well, yeah, I guess this time there, there, won't, there will be less removals since 
we have cleaned up already last year. Okay. Hi, Lokopi. Lokopi is doing very odd things. Yeah. It's completely different to me. Okay, then I, I, I put two, two <laughs> topics here which just came to my mind. I don't, don't know how much there is to discuss, but looking back at the last year, there were two <coughs> kind of major events. One was the release of Perl 526. Uh, I don't know, Dominic, had, what's your um, summary? I, I wasn't as involved in it this year as I was in previous years, but it seemed to be all the more rapid for that. <laughs> At least it was very smooth from what I observed and the work I did. Um, so thanks to Nico for doing most of the work there and to Gregor and everyone else for fixing all the bugs that needed fixing in the packages. We had more failures reported subsequently than in previous years, which were from packages where we hadn't run QA um, because we only run test rebuilds on packages depending on build depending on Perl. Um, so if packages only use Perl base, we don't test them. And I think we should probably extend that at least for one run to do a full archive rebuild next next year, um, because it's always nice to avoid problems before they arise. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as I know, the schedule remains constant upstream. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do we already know something about five twenty eight? So like. Do we already know if there are some big issues coming up with 5.28? Um, not that I know of. I don't think there's been any, yeah, I can't remember anything specific, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, so anything else to 5.26? No. Okay, then we also had a, a, a release of stretch and a freeze That's right. before it. Vaguely remember. Yeah, yeah, there was something. <laughs> so it, it, it all went so fast. <laughs> the freeze was quite short, yeah, compared to previous years. Uh, again, the same question: Is there something to discuss about it, to to learn from it, from our side? So you mentioned the other day that whether we should avoid uploading to unstable during the freeze next time. I'm, I'm not so involved in uploading lots of packages within the team, but um, would it be helpful to allow leaf package uploads within the team more freely? Or I think that's already our current policy in theory too. We can upload to seed unless it's something that has like lots of reverse depths or is critical or risky, no? I thought that's already what we settled in the past. Maybe we just were a bit too shy and didn't need to implement it to its full extent in practice. What, what, I, what I was thinking recently was there's, uh, if there's no strong need for us to, to upload to Artstable, I have felt that there's a, a change in the, the attitude towards, from the release team in, in how this should be used, or with all the automated removals, so testing and these things. So there's also the, the angle looking at this from that we are, it's a, it's a large number of packages and we are sending a message to, in support of the release team saying that well, we are keeping clear of unstable even if we don't need to keep clear, we, we could make that extra effort, just as a, mm. a, a sign to others. So that's, for me, it is not, personally, for me, I have not felt this time around that I really needed to put it, on, put it into unstable. It's just a convenience that I don't need to go and maintain and, and track things in experimental. So I don't personally need to, I'm not burdened by us deciding that we go through experimental during the freeze. Mm 
Okay, Tincho, the IRC. Um, yes, there were comments from Nico uh, saying first, Ale uh, thanks Alex for the inactive contributor pings. Uh, regarding 526, we should have just rebuilt uh, the whole archive, not just source Perl build reverse dependencies. Uh, otherwise, it was great, and the infrastructure is much, be much better nowadays, thanks to Dam. Dom. Sorry. Uh, then Carnil said, "Reproducible? No. Uh, regarding freeze, I uploaded partial packages to an experimental instead, so that we don't lag too much behind. And then after the release, move them from experimental to seed. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> also, Nico adds just now that we should mo mostly refrain from unnecessary blows to unstable during freezes." Yeah, so why I brought this up in a dis discussion with, with Dominic is that, so historically this was the second freeze where we didn't upload to unstable. The, the, I don't know how many before where, where I was involved, we just kept on going except for some important packages. Um, and yeah, and we got a bit shy and, <laughs> and cautious, uh, which, is okay and has, has of course good reasons. But what worries me a bit is that, uh, well, first of all, we have a huge backlog now, which was like 400 packages with new upstream releases, and it's not really shrinking. But what worries me more is that I have this, this feeling, which might be wrong, it's just a gut feeling, that we as a, as a team lose, lose momentum during, during the freeze. So the people who were active before, with updating packages, um, f fixing a bug a week or whatever, who were around, then, well, sat back and waited during the freeze and um, um, are not really um, coming back at the same speed as before. I mean, may maybe also because it's July and August and summer and there are better things to do than sitting at, at the laptop and updating Perl packages. But I'm also wondering if this is somehow related to the freeze and if this is, <coughs> well, <laughs> a good development. So I'd rather tend to consider to be a bit less shy and to at least keep on uploading these fringe packages which don't really matter for the release. Um, my thinking there is that this is not a Perl problem. This is, this is a general Debian problem, and we are sort of subverting the general project by saying that, well, we do differently from what, we, what the whole project generally is being told by the release managers. Well, hey, this is a freeze. We should all focus on the sort of the boring stuff and, and the, getting, getting the freeze, getting the release out. And, and if, we, if we are concerned about our contributors being bored, <laughs> then that's exactly the same situation all over the board. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I, I think it is the wrong solution or the wrong approach to then uh, ignore the release managers in this. We should then raise the question more generally and seeing a fringe packages in Debian, could those be exempt from some more aggressively or postponed to later in the freeze, things like that. Having the dialogue uh, in the whole project I think is better. So unless I've missed something, the release team has never said, I mean, the, the release team has always said it's fine, at least in the early stages of the freeze, to work on leaf packages and upload them to unstable. And a lot of our packages are leaf by some definition. So I think I'm agreeing with you in a way that we shouldn't have anything special for the Perl team. Um, <laughs> And since you mentioned numbers, if you say four, 400 packages backlog, maybe a fifth of those are mine, or the ones that is, has my name on it. Yeah, <laughs> not, yeah, not mine, sure. but I'm just saying I have been slow to, to uh, get up to speed again lately. So, Like everyone else. It's <laughs> Does anyone have any idea how many uh, unblock requests we had to submit during the search freeze because uh, unblock request because that's 
essentially what matters about uploading to seed, it will become a problem if and only if you need to send an unblock, unblock request later on. If in practice we submitted very few of them, and maybe it's always the same packages every release that needs some a block request for some reason, then maybe it's not such a, a big of a blocker. I don't remember if, if we had a, any unblock request during this freeze, but if we had it was a, at a very low single digit number. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that would make sense to like update the packages just in JIT without like actually uploading. I just, would it make sense like someone could just like keep going and in in the package and pack package tracker, it would just, the pet, it would just show up like in another category, which is like not the like completely stalled or, or needs work to be done, but it's like the in progress kind of state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karen Drag from IRC says he was one of the people who joined the team during the freeze. Um, he didn't care that they weren't part of the release. Uh, they're now in unstable and testing. Um, but I guess that's a, that's a specific bit of feedback about new packages, whereas yeah. um, the more general <coughs> questions about exist, existing ones as well. Um, and Alex M says that Jonas has a point in focusing on the release during the freeze and help fixing other issues so that the, so that the release happens sooner. Um, having Nico says having testing and unstable not in sync during the later stages of the stretch freeze excluded getting priority important fixes through together through through all together um, now he left but but this this question of how many how many uh, unblocking requests we we request we asked for also has the risk that we don't notice what is the damage for packages depending on per libraries. I'm just thinking that maybe we miss some of the, the, the collateral damage that we cause. Uh, I don't know, uh, I'm just saying that that could be also a risk. Yeah, just an interesting point here because especially during the freeze I was looking at things and I just realized that I just sometimes do not have the background, the expertise, and or the time <laughs> to actually do it. So for me, like during the, like the simple, like, I don't know, maybe too weird saying this, but the brain dead stuff, like just uploading new packages, that is some, or updating, that works for me. I might find something in the like the freeze like release critical bugs where I can jump in but usually not it just it probably <coughs> need, would need more time investment from me however the simple easiest stuff I can probably yeah. do well in, in general since we have this auto removals from from testing the the list of RC bugs is quite small and contains difficult bugs so the, the times when you could just pick any random RC bug in any silly packages are gone, which is great, but uh, yeah. But so, so I, I, I would just here repeat my point that this is a general Debian situation that, that the, the days of, of simple bugs helping out, feeling that you help out with the freeze, we have, we have passed that on to the robots. So sorry, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> we're, we're all being replaced by scripts. <laughs> which is good, hopefully. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know if anyone has been taking notes, but what I have in mind is this is a general problem in, in Debian, that's true. That the freeze policy doesn't explicitly forbid to upload leaf packages in at least in the early stage of the freeze if you are aware that it might be removed from testing. Hmm? And so that means that maybe we should try the next time to be a bit less shy if someone feels like uploading some 
random packages. So, so, that is. Yeah, so so play, yeah. play, play by the right, but play by the De Debian the general Debian rules, which is both be more bold when we are allowed when we are permitted, but then also respect it more uh, clearly. And if we disagree, then throw it to the whole Debian. Mm -hmm. There is a couple of comments on IRC. Yeah. Um, at least can draw how it's pronounced. It says I get that my moves were a bit unsync with the release purpose, but if, have, if I had been rejected because I was doing it and told to wait for the release, I might have not come back. Mm. I hope that my new package releases did not have an effect on delaying the release, and are a win in the end because there is more packages later. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. As you said, new packages are just fine and are not the not an issue and so yeah it was helpful for Debian no, not the problem good so much for the freeze until next next year <laughs> oh yeah okay so <clears throat> random other points actually I didn't look at the open tasks page this year but some one thing I, I'd like to mention is git depth cherry and then someone has been Adding another point to the bottom. So, Git Depth Cherry. Is everyone familiar with this <laughs> funny thing? <laughs> so, like three years ago, four years ago, whatever, we've been discussing the handling of patches in our uh, packages, where there are several tools to have patches applied, which is the preferred way of working for some people, so when you import a new upstream release, you yeah, either get rid of the <coughs> commits because they are merged upstream, or you can just uh, fix merge conflicts in your editor, which seems to be more appealing to some people in contrast to working with Quilt and Debian patches afterwards. So in 2015, I think at the sprint, or before the sprint in Barcelona, uh, Nico added some wrapper scripts around git depth cherry, which is a tool to export commits from master branch, which are not in the upstream branch, as files in Debian patches. And at DebCon 15 in Heidelberg, we said w we would experiment with this thingy. So it's not only git depth cherry, but also taking git nodes to have the metadata for the patches there's a bit of machinery. Okay, in practice, this, in practice we had four packages. One is libloc, log for Perl, Perl, which Manoj has maintained with git dpm originally, and then it somehow went to git tap, tap cherry, but it, used, it doesn't use any nodes. And Florian has, in Heidelberg, converted three packages to use this git depth cherry machinery. One doesn't have any patches anymore, so there are two left. One is libmodule build Perl, and the other I don't remember. Uh, yeah, and the practice is, so it's three packages left, which is not much in our 3,000 some hundred packages. And it seems like, like no one is really using it I think in practice it's that Salvatore or me look at new upstream release of lib module build Perl and then we have to try to remember how this git depth cherry wrapper machinery actually works. And this lib log for Perl, Perl git repository is for various reasons messed up each year. So I, each summer I have to ask David to fix this, this git repo. Okay, so some, my summary is this git depth cherry experiment did not really work out, and we should, um, well, stop it and convert the three remaining packages to normal, under quotation, packages. Opinions, comments, experiences? Just, can you just clarify what you think normal is, for the record? <laughs> well, like, like all, all other packages except those three, so patches unapplied and quilt Manually. I mean, is there somewhere who would like to continue GitHub Cherry or other experiments? Or? Yeah. 
can we just call it a finished experiment? Well, one, one detail worries me a bit is that when you're saying that everybody forgot, <laughs> it's like, um, was it not written down in README source? What was the it supposed uh, yeah, yeah, procedure? Sure. So I was just curious if, if, if also the, the, the doom, the judgment of this experiment, was, if that could be thrown into a wiki page somewhere to the people who were curious about Debtary other places so that they can at least know, ah, these people tried it and ran away screaming, or maybe some more details of why is this not interesting. It's just the details, right? three out of 3,000 packages were, got uh, excited about this, and that's the reason Perl team decided not to do it. Whatever it is, so that others can learn from, mm -hmm. or can gain from our experiment. Okay. I was not part of the experiment, so I don't even know if I agree or disagree. I just let others mm -hmm. decide. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the main point, that no one was actually really right. taking part in the experiment. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Okay, and then someone added a point. I don't know who this dark blue. Okay. Perl package is not part of Perl team. Yeah, <laughs> Perl package is not part of the Perl team is a topic we discuss each year, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we did some UDD work to identify these packages and then I failed to do anything with the list. So I think that's at least from the point of view of identifying packages which we could uh, add some value to by adopting them. There's still work to be done. So, and how would we proceed if we had the list? We just need to email the maintainers and say, hey, I, I think, uh, I don't remember what the exact criteria were now. Did we look at packages that were, looked like Perl packages that hadn't been uploaded within a certain amount of time and weren't Perl team maintained? Yeah, or, or, it's or maintained by NMUs. It's hundreds, I think. I think it's probably at least a hundred, yeah. Um, I guess we could try and kick that off, effort off again. It would seem to make sense to see if there are, to, to try and head off problems before they occur, because it's, there's quite a big overhead when it comes to NMUing packages that are, aren't being actively maintained by people who are, who know about the current Perl stuff. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we shouldn't, uh, we should allow people to maintain packages if they want. So. <laughs> How about a friendly uh, note through a wishlist bug? So we both, we can track it. We can track the whole uh, bunch, uh, the whole bunch of it and it's signaled as this is a wish list thing. It's not that we want to push you out. You are well, very welcome to continue if you like. We just want to know where are you around this. And because it's a bug report, we can elevate it. When we get no response for two weeks, we can elevate it to, to minor. <laughs> and then we can let it hang there for half a year or whatever long we want. Yeah. And through all this time, we have an easy way of having a status report. Mm -hmm. just, just to to make sure that it's, a, it's an offer, it's not about taking away the package, but bringing, bringing in you a little bit, giving you 100 co-maintainers and user tag it somehow. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. So who is going to? <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I volunteered last time, so I should probably make good on that. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, and I was just also going to say, this is very much the same tone as the messages that uh, Lucas has been sending out about packages which haven't built for years. Ah. It's, it, it starts off as a wish list or not sure what severity bug is on the package. And then, well, it's a bit different, but he, he, you know, he will eventually propose RMs for those. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it, it's the same tone. It's, it's just offering, yep. oh, asking for clarification and ah. offering help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And just to catch up on IRC on the same conversation. 
Um, so if the bugs, if the packages are buggy, we should just make sure that we file bugs on them, which I think we do. So maybe the uh, so, um, so Karen Drog says, I didn't mean adopting or fixing the packages. I think it would just be useful to inform them that the package doesn't work properly. Uh, the packager had no idea it wasn't working. So maybe there's more QA that we could do even on packages we don't maintain. So we could add them to pet, says Alex M. Mm. We could, we could try and make sure that we run auto package test on them, but in that case, we're sort of getting closer to maintaining them and, and it seems like a... Yeah. I mean, we are catching the ones which are, are C-buggy in each year when there's a new Perl release. Yes. I have some old friends in that list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I also have locally some packages where the last three uploads were NMUs for 520 something. <laughs> I would say start with it. Start with the tracking of what is the whole pool we're talking about, and then obviously yeah. file box when we stumble upon them, right. but us proactively going out and, 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 and hunting them around. Mm. Sure, if anybody has this, uh, the excess time, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. That is generally what we do in Debian. That's, I mean, but, but, but uh, organizing that this is what we must do, well, then we're talking about our responsibility, and mm -hmm. that is what we are offering to do if they want us to do. Right. So let's, let's take it from the end. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, um, the director completely forgot about the time, but it's already quarter to one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, uh, we should close soon. Yeah, so yeah? Uh, just a random idea. Maybe if, if there is a package which was NMU'd by someone from the PER team, it could uh, it could appear in the pet list, unless someone like the original maintainers makes a later update. It could like appear in the list, and it's just like someone just after a while can take a look at it. Like, okay, this have been an mute, and it's like an mute for like a year. It's like maybe maybe do something about it. Like, it's not 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 owned by the per team. Yeah, I mean, pet takes information from our Git repositories, so. Would mean oh. we, we need to import something and then it gets fussy. Okay. Okay, so since we're out of time, any last comments, thoughts? Please, you say. Last words. <laughs> <laughs> last words? Well, let's keep, up. Last words. let's keep up the good work together. Shall we?